working. Okay, there we go. So the menu for the day is, uh, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to uh, Nano in general, just for a few minutes, so we, so we put a context on everything that I want to talk about. Uh, and then we're going to spend most of the time talking about uh, ways in which we can probe nanostructures. So look at, look at them, uh, manipulate them, uh, understand their properties and the relationship between their, uh, their uh, structure and their function. Uh, and we'll take a dive down then into uh, the scanning tunneling microscope and atomic force microscopy and all the different things that can be measured with that. Um, and then we'll say a little bit about, I'll sort of intersperse the talk with some um, examples of nanoscale engineering. Um, so just very, very quickly, the sort of an overview of the sort of things that I'm going to talk about um, and some that I won't, but just to give you an idea of the sort of background uh, that I'm coming from. Uh, so the image on the top left, because I have a laser point, but that's no use to anybody else. Um, so over on the left here, so we've got, um, so these are all images taken with scanning probe microscopes. Um, and the one on the left is, uh, so it's uh, actually C60 on uh, graphite surface, uh, forms nice self-assembled uh, monolayers, um, image with the scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, the next image, so we, we look at um, molecular electronics, so making small devices uh, a few nanometers across that uh, can contain a number of, uh, small numbers of organic molecules. We're interested in uh, developing techniques for probing the electrical properties of organic systems. Uh, then uh, the next image is uh, it's a magnetic force microscope image of uh, permaloy nanodots. Uh, so looking at, the again, the relationship between the structure and magnetic properties of magnetic nanostructures. Uh, then there's a little bit on oil recovery. So we did some work with BP a few years ago where we looked at uh, the wettability, oil wettability of um, uh, well bore samples. So this is just uh, an atomic force microscope image of uh, coccoliths uh, from a, a uh, North Sea oil well. And then on the bottom, there's an image, that's actually an image of a hair. So we do a lot of work with uh, Unilever, looking at um, again the the actually the molecular structure of hair using atomic force microscopy based techniques. Um, so this is a, a phrase that's often used and misquoted. Uh, so many of you will be aware of this this uh, this talk that uh, Richard Feynman gave in 1959, uh, entitled uh, "There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom." If you read any, pretty much any PhD thesis or uh, paper on, on nanotechnology, they'll start with this phrase and they'll say that this was the phrase that kick-started nanotechnology. Um, and the interesting thing is if you speak to any of the uh, core people who developed nanotechnology at the beginning in the early 80s, they freely admit that they weren't aware of this talk until about 10 years after. Uh, um, and which was a bit disappointing to me because I Thought, uh, I thought Feynman started all off myself. Um, and then there's an image on the bottom right. That, again, I want to go into much more detail on this when the time is right. Uh, it's a scanning tunneling microscope image of um, its individual iron atoms on a copper surface, um, just demonstrating that atoms can be moved at will uh, into desired locations on the surface. So that's, in a way, it's the ultimate nanoscale engineering. Whether it's of any practical use is an entirely different matter. Uh, but it's just to, I want to show you some of the things that are possible. So why is the nanometer such an important length scale? And the main reason is it's to do with the uh, length scales associated with many of the properties of materials. And by that I specifically mean mechanical length, so length scales over which strain um, is felt, you know, electronic mean free path, uh, optical skin depth, um, magnetic exchange length, chemical bond lengths. And these are all typically in the range of a few fractions of a nanometer to a few tens of nanometers. So once you pattern materials in these length scales, then you start to be able to, to tailor uh, the way those materials behave. Um, and it becomes very dependent on the, uh, on the geometry. So there are many different definitions of nanotechnology, and the one that's uh, the safest one uh, that's, that I use is that it's the ability to both create and study structures with critical dimensions of the order 1 to 100 nanometers. Um, and that's exactly the length scale at which the scanning probe techniques come to the fore. Uh, so how big is a nanometer scale? I'm not going to waste time uh, going through this. 
Um, but just you've got um, approximately 11 figures here, all at different length scales. So starting on the top left, you've got a child who's a meter tall. Uh, and each image progressively is a factor of 10 smaller. And by the time you go down to uh, the nanometer scale um, down here, so the sort of size of a cell membrane is on the order of uh, 100 nanometers thick. Uh, you get to a, a sugar molecule, it's about a nanometer across. Uh, then atoms themselves, uh, well, how big is an atom? It's typically 0.1 nanometers or so. Um, so we're interested in basically the last three um, uh, feature sizes. Um, and now I'm not going to bother with this particular slide. I've decided I'm going to uh, just speed up a little bit. Uh, so how do we actually investigate materials at the nanometer scale? So it started off with optical microscopy. So it's got a resolution on the order of uh, half a micron or so. Uh, if you're clever and play with uh, confocal microscopy, you can get it down to about 100, 150 nanometers. Um, and um, then you can access smaller length scales um, on the atomic scale by electron microscopy. So you've got SEM, so scanning electron microscopy, TEM, and STEM. Um, which are a very powerful family of techniques, but they require quite, uh, quite special sample preparation. Can't look at uh, samples in um, in vitro or in a liquid environment. Uh, not not good for biological samples. And there are just microscopy techniques. It's quite difficult to do anything apart from just looking at things. So that's where scanning probe microscopy is is so powerful. Um, and because you can both image and manipulate materials at, at these length scales from a fraction of a nanometer up to microns, tens of microns across. Um, and there is a, a video that I, if you get a chance to have a look at, it's worth looking at. Uh, it's called The Boy and His Atom. So it was, it was done by, it was made by IBM. Um, and we'll see, I'll tell you in a few minutes why IBM. Um, in 2013, so you've got a, you can see the image on the left. It's this is an STM image of um, a boy, uh, where each dot is uh, a single carbon monoxide molecule that has been uh, positioned at a precise location on the surface, um, and this is both um, created and imaged using scanning tunneling microscopy. And again, I shall say a little bit about that in about 10 minutes. So then, what exactly is scanning probe microscopy? So, um, so it is, like I say, it's a family of, of techniques. It's really, once these techniques were uh, developed, that's what, re what really kickstarts the whole area of nanotechnology. And it started in the early 80s. Um, and the basic principle behind scanning probe microscopy is that you have a sharp tip, so a probe. So you have a probe, which is in, placed in close proximity to a sample surface. And you basically uh, you making use of the fact that when any two um, entities come in close contact with each other or come close to each other, then they start to interact. And what I mean by close is anywhere from um, a few angstroms all the way to a few hundred nanometers. You get a whole range of interactions ranging from uh, from very close. You deal with you're dealing with uh, chemical bond formation. Uh, if you're a little bit further out, you have van der Waals forces. A little bit further out again, you're sensitive to electrostatic and uh, magnetostatic interactions. So there are a whole range of uh, interactions that we can make use of and um, actually map uh, these interactions between a test probe and a sample. And we can use that then to, uh, to map uh, many properties of materials. Um, and the resolution is determined by uh, basically the size of your probe, the distance between the probe and the surface, and the nature of the interaction that you're probing, what its characteristic length scale is. Um, so the primary um, scanning probe microscope techniques that, that I want to focus on are the scanning tunneling microscope, where the interaction is uh, it's quantum tunneling uh, between a probe that's a few angstroms away from a surface and a conductive surface, um, and the atomic force microscope, which, is, uh, which has very many different interactions that we can play with. And the way the scanning probe microscope works is that we monitor that interaction. Um, we have a control loop. So we have a sensor which detects the strength of interaction. And we'll say a bit more about that in a few minutes when we look at the specific microscopes. Um, so you sense the strength of the interaction. You have a control loop 
which, monit which monitors that interaction and keeps it at some set value. And then the, the probe or tip is mounted on an actuator which scans across the surface and the control loop controls the distance between the probe and the surface in order to uh, control the interaction. Um, so the first was a scanning tunneling microscope. So the, um, I'll say a little bit about, so I'll go back and forth between basic principles and application and a bit about the history. Uh, so the basic principle is that you have a sharp metal tip, typically made out of tungsten, um, which is uh, scanned in close proximity to a sample surface. Uh, it has to be a conductive surface for this to work. Um, and by close proximity, I mean less than one nanometer. And if you apply a small voltage between the probe and the surface, then uh, you get a tunneling current. And if we just look in a little bit more detail, so looking at the probe apex, um, so we've got... Um, so we've got a tip then, so these little spheres represent individual atoms. So we have a, a probe tip, which is uh, just a few atomic distances above a surface. Uh, if we apply voltage between the tip and the surface, um, given that they're close enough, uh, we'll get a uh, quantum tunneling current. And um, basically that's the interaction that we measure. So we scan the tip above the surface, maintaining a constant tunneling current. So the probe will then basically follow the atomic uh, features in order to keep a constant distance away from the surface, which will uh, give us a constant current. And then we can just simply measure how much we've had to move the probe to keep a constant current, and then we can use that to build up an image of the surface. Um, so in a little bit more specific detail, and that's really what I want to do today, because uh, I know many of you will be familiar with these techniques, uh, so I want to sort of... Um, talk about them at different levels all the way from the very fun fundamental principles to uh, how we actually use them. Uh, so the more fundamental principle of STM, uh, so again you have your probe tip above a surface uh, at some distance I'm calling Z. You have electrons flowing uh, back and forth between the tip and the surface depending on uh, the polarity of the voltage you apply between the probe and the surface. Um, and the best way to get an understanding of what STM is actually doing and measuring is if you look at it from an, ener an uh, energetic point of view. So what I've plotted in this figure is, uh, so we're looking at the, um, the energy levels that the electrons in this system will see. So if we start off in the tip, so the tip is up here, and so what, what this curve, what this plot is showing is an energy level plot starting from the tip, moving through this uh, vacuum gap, and then into the sample. So this, this shaded region here is the, uh, they're the um, electron energy levels within the tip that are filled all the way up to the Fermi energy. So this uh, dark line here that I've labeled here, that's the Fermi energy of the tip. Then likewise, we've got a sample. Now I'm presuming that both tip and sample are uh, metals, uh, so there's no band gaps or anything to worry about. Um, so we've got the sample energy levels filled all the way up to the sample Fermi energy. We've applied a voltage between the tip and the sample, and what that's done is it has shifted the, um, the, energy, the Fermi energy of the sample down by an amount EV, where V is the voltage we applied, E is electron charge. So it's shifted the uh, uh, sample's Fermi energy down by that amount. So what we have now is we have an overlap between the filled energy levels uh, of electrons in the tip on the left and the empty energy levels of the sample on the right. So electrons can tunnel across this vacuum gap. So the vacuum gap, um, so it's got a, a height of phi, where phi is the work function of the, um, of the system, of the tip and the sample. I'm assuming they're both the same at the moment. Um, and then this vacuum gap has uh, the width we're calling Z. So that's the distance of the tip away from the surface. Um, so how much current is actually going to flow in this situation? Because at the end of the day, what we're measuring in an STM is the current that flows between the tip and the sample, or vice versa. So the current is going to depend on a number of parameters. The first is how many electrons are available in the tip. So that's the density of states of the tip. It's given the symbol uh, rho s. Depends on the, uh, how many available energy levels there are in the sample. So that's um, given the symbol rho t, so the density of electronic states in the sample. Um, and then we have our, um, the parameters describing this tunneling barrier. Uh, so there's the height of the barrier, which is important, the width is important, and that's all encapsulated in something known as the transmission probability. Uh, so it's the quantum transmission probability, uh, which is given the symbol T. Um, so the current that flows is given by that expression I've got on the right. 
Um, so it depends on the density of state of the sample, of the tip, and the transmission probability of that tunneling barrier. And um, obviously this transmission probability will also depend on anything that we have within this vacuum barrier. So if there's a molecule um, or some other species other than just uh, empty space, then it will also have energy levels that we can tunnel into and out of. Um, now we can actually simplify this, thankfully. Um, and the uh, tunneling current roughly follows this uh, sort of exponential um, format that the tunneling current, so J is the current density, uh, depends on, um, so it's like I say, it's an exponential, depends on the work function um, of the uh, tip and sample and the distance between the tip and the sample. Now I've changed, just to um, confuse you, I've uh, replaced the distance between the tip and the sample. Instead of Z, I'm calling it D down here. Um, so that's just to see if you're awake. Uh, so typical values then that we're dealing with. Uh, so typical metal uh, has a work function of around 4 eV. Uh, typical distance between the tip and the sample is on the order of half a nanometer. Um, typical tunneling current that you get when you apply on the order of a few hundred millivolts between the tip and the sample. Typical tunneling current is on the order of a few hundred uh, picoamps to a nanoamp. So they're the sort of numbers you're dealing with in an SCM. Uh, so like I say, the STM was invented in 1981 uh, by two IBM researchers, so Binnig and Rohr, um, and uh, they got the Nobel Prize five years later. Uh, just that's, That doesn't happen very often, that it's that quick, and it's just an indication of how this uh, seemingly fairly fundamental uh, development revolutionized quite a few areas of science. Um, so what we have on the left is, <clears throat> this is taken from, uh, it's actually taken from an IBM um, in-house magazine from uh, 1989, um, and it's just uh, showing an STM, so you've got an STM tip here, uh, so this, this big thick needle, um, um, and it's very close then to some uh, metallic surface. Um, and then on the bottom right, we have, uh, this is the first problem that the STM was used to crack, which was the uh, surface atomic arrangement on the silicon uh, 111 surface, because uh, conventional uh, methods that are used to uh, work out the atomic arrangement, so uh, lead or, and Auger and so on, um, had an electron diffraction had come up with two possible models uh, to describe the uh, arrangement of atoms on a silicon surface, so they didn't actually know what the arrangement was, so the STM was used to directly look at it and found that the, the correct arrangement is described in knowing what's called a 7x7 seven, uh, seven seven, um, unit cell. Uh, so that was the first problem that was used. It was uh, of direct relevance to the semiconductor industry because they wanted to know what, what surface they were working with. Um, so there are many tip sample interactions in scanning probe microscopes. So the, so the Basically, when you bring a probe close to a surface, there are many, many different things that happen uh, at different length scales, different time scales. You have uh, tunneling currents to think about. Uh, you've got electrostatic interactions um, and uh, magnetic and uh, various other interactions to think about. So what a tip actually looks like, so this is an, uh, an STM tip uh, image using an electron microscope. Um, and uh, they typically have a radius of curvature of a few nanometers. And what, are most, what, I, what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about later is are the force interactions between a tip and a surface. So this is um, probably the most complicated curve that I will uh, show today. What it's showing is, so the y-axis is showing a force between uh, an AFM tip, or between a tip, uh, um, a probe tip and a surface, and the x-axis is the distance between, well, it's just a distance. I'm not going to say between the probe and the surface because there's still a bit of uh, uncertainty as to how you define contact in, in between two materials. How do you define when they're physically in contact? Um, so what we have here is there are a number of things that you can measure, and I'll show you later on a couple of examples of things that we can measure. Um, when you've got uh, a probe tip coming close to a surface, you get they start interacting with each other uh, mechanically. Um, and then by looking at this interaction, we can actually measure quite a number of properties of the material that we're looking at. Um, so if you start off, so the, the green curve is showing what happens 
when you move a tip in towards the surface. So I'm sorting out far away, move a tip in towards the surface, and then you start to reach a point where um, the, so the, the tip starts interacting with the surface, it feels long range electrostatic forces, and once you get, once you get to a point where the uh, force gradient is, is equal to the uh, mechanical stiffness of the probe, then the probe will snap into contact. So that's this point here. And then thereafter, it's in uh, physical contact and it enters a repulsive regime where as you push the probe further into the surface, the probe just deforms, as does the surface. When you pull the probe back again, so that's this curve down here, then what you find is you find that there, was, that there is always a difference, that you have to pull the tip or the probe further out in order to pull it back off the surface. And this shaded region gives you the adhesion energy um, of that system, and which tells you a bit about the energy dissipation uh, of the system. So we, we can measure all of these properties that I've indicated here. Everything that's labeled here is something that we can measure, and you can use that to then map uh, physical properties of, of a material. Um, so a little bit more detail on the scanning tunneling microscope. So this is one in, in our lab. Uh, it's a UHV STM. Now STM can be carried out under ambient conditions at the liquid solid interface and preferably under UHV. Um, and so this is just, if you have a look at this, you can see, it's quite hard to see actually because of the scale of this. This is inside a vacuum chamber. Um, and so what you have here, so you've got a sample and then there's a tip. Like I say, it is quite hard to see, but the tip is uh, the same as that image on the previous slide where you see this um, sharp needle. Um, then what happens when you look at an STM in action? So this is, uh, so there's, this is uh, some work uh, done by um, a group in Northwestern about 10 years ago where they uh, built an STM and put it inside an electron microscope. And so just a short video to show you of the tip as it scans over a surface just to give it get a feeling for um, what this thing looks like when it's working. So we've got a tip and it is scanning above a surface. So these are just uh, metal, uh, it's metal that was sputtered onto um, a carbon surface. Uh, it's gold on a carbon surface and the tip is scanning across. Unfortunately, there isn't an, ST, uh, an image to show what the STM image looks like at the same time, um, which would have been nice. Um, but uh, so that's that. And then the sort of things that we look at, I mean, you can basically use an STM to look at anything that's conductive. Uh, so something that we're quite interested in is looking at uh, graphite and graphene. Uh, so I'll just show you a couple of examples. So this is an image that we took uh, a few years ago now. At the time, it was the highest resolution STM image of graphene uh, that was in uh, the literature. And so it's the scale bar there is 0.4 nanometers. And uh, each individual dot, each individual bright spot that you see is a single carbon atom. So you can see the individual hexagonal rings. And um, uh, so, well, that's basically that. Um, and you can combine that then with, or which we often do with, with uh, DFT calculations so that you can actually unpick what exactly it is that you're seeing. Uh, probably not that interesting from a graphene point of view because it's fairly obvious, but there are other examples I'll show you in a minute where you actually uh, need to do some modeling in order to uh, be able to figure out what exactly you're looking at. Um, again, I'm not going to waste much time on this image, but this is just, again, this is actually a graphite surface and it's uh, a, what I've called a grain boundary, but it's 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 a bit um, suspicious calling it that because it's only a single atomic layer thick. Um, and the main point really is just so it's it's a it's an STM image, and the bright spots here are uh, regions of enhanced electron density. And the main thing to pick out from this is that the um, you know when you're far away from the boundary, as in three or four nanometers. You just see a nice simple uh, atomic arrangement, the classic arrangement of graphite. But then as you get closer and closer to the grain boundary, it starts to look different and you start to see all sorts of ring structures and so on. Um, and that's just, uh, it's all to do with the distortion of the density of states of the system near a grain boundary. So these are just an example of the sort of things that you can probe with an STM. Um, I'm just going to uh, look at, show you this bit next. Uh, so of course, I did mention that with an STM, you can have a current flowing back and forth between the probe and the surface. So what I really mean by that is that depending on the polarity of voltage that you apply to the system, you can either have uh, electrons flowing from 
the sample to the tip or from the tip to the sample. And depending on what you choose, either so if you if you um, apply a positive voltage onto the sample relative to the tip, then uh, what you will do is electrons will then flow uh, from the tip into the sample. So they will probe the empty electronic states in the sample. And that's what this image is showing here. So it's a silicon 111 surface. Uh, the area that's being probed here is 10 nanometers. Uh, if, you, if you then swap the polarity and now apply a, a negative voltage on the sample uh, relative to the tip, then electrons will tell from the sample to the tip. And this is what you see. So you see a completely different arrangement. Um, it's exactly the same area. And in fact, it's imaged uh, pretty much simultaneously. Um, and it's just showing you that, in fact, what that means then is that these individual spots that you can see in each image, they're actually not atoms. They're just regions of enhanced electron density. Um, so you need to be very careful with STM that uh, you don't think that when you uh, take an image that it's showing you atoms. It's showing you a map of the electronic density of states, which for a conductor turns out to be the same thing as the atoms. Um, then what other things can we do? So uh, this is something that's, again, is of particular interest to me. Uh, this is some work that, um, that we did about five or six years ago using a low temperature STM. Uh, what we have here is, so it's a gold 111 surface. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a particular interest for anybody who's, who's looking at self-assembly. Um, and um, the particularly curious thing about this surface is that the, um, so the surface unit cell has 46 atoms, whereas the bulk unit cell of gold has 44 atoms. So it means that the top layer of gold is incommensurate with the rest of it, uh, with the layers underneath. And so it, it's, uh, you get the, the top surface then uh, actually forms these, these periodic buckles on the surface. And it, that's called a herringbone reconstruction. And what you find is that there are some areas where the uh, atoms in the top layer um, are exactly close packed relative to the atoms underneath. Uh, I've indicated that with the HCP label. And then other areas where you've got uh, FCC, packing, so face-centered cubic. And then these bright lines that you have, they're what are called bridging sites. Uh, it's where you've got this evolution between hexagonal close packing and face-centered cubic. Um, and this, the fact that you've got this additional um, uh, atomic arrangement on the surface leads to the creation of a surface state, uh, which is just uh, 400 millivolts uh, below the Fermi energy. And that's indicated uh, by the graph on the bottom. So it's an electrical measurement of the density of states. Uh, you see the small uh, uh, change in the density of states. That's just demonstrating that there is a surface state. Um, so the thing I want to show you is, um, so we looked at, uh, so we had a particular interest in cobalt porphyrin. So, it's, uh, so this is a molecular species that's used as a catalyst in nit uh, nitrogenation reaction. Um, and so we've got a series of STM images here. There are four. Um, and um, basically, the, each spot that you see is a single cobalt porphyrin molecule. Uh, so this is all under UHV conditions. Um, and you can see in the image on the, on the top left, those lines um, that are running from the top to the bottom, uh, they are the herringbone reconstruction. And um, what you notice is so the, the next image over, the one with the 6 nanometer scale bar, is uh, just a zoom in. And you notice that, um, so you see a number of, of these molecules look a little bit different. Um, so I've got three just here. And what it is is that, that uh, these, are, these molecules are aligned along the herringbone reconstruction lines. And if you look a little bit closer, so the images on the bottom, uh, so these, uh, so I put in the scales just under a nanometer. Uh, so you've got nine cobalt porphyrin molecules here, nicely arranged. And then here, uh, it looks a little bit different. So this area is actually centered on one of those reconstruction lines. And what we found is that the molecules which are uh, locked onto those bridging sites on the gold surface actually change their conformation. Uh, their interaction with the surface is so strong. Um, and what we noticed, when look, again, looking in more detail, is that, um, that these molecules actually form chiral assemblies on a gold surface, which they do not do otherwise. Um, okay, then uh, it's another very, very quick example. So um, of a particular interest in uh, graphene mimics. 
So these are coronine molecules. Uh, this, uh, I know this is something that's of interest to some of the folks in Manchester. Um, and so we uh, deposit these, they're actually on graphite. Um, and so we've got an STM image there, which is uh, figure panel A. And you see a very messy looking pattern. There's a scale bar there, 1.2 nanometers. So the entire image is uh, six nanometers across. And we've just indicated uh, in the blue what the actual arrangement of these molecules on that surface is. If you zoom in, uh, so the image down the bottom left, panel C, is it's just over one nanometer wide. It's 1.05 nanometers wide. And you've got a single molecule. And we've just tried to indicate where that molecule is. Um, and so that's all well and good, but um, it's not massively high resolution. I mean, you can just about see each benzene ring, but of course, don't forget that the electrons are delocalized in this system, so it's quite difficult to uh, get atomic resolution under normal conditions. But what we found was that if we, and I wish I could say that this is done by design, um, like all of these things, it was by complete accident, we found that under uh, certain conditions, we could actually get um, intermolecular or sub-molecular resolution, so atomic resolution in these molecular systems. And the condition is that you basically pick up a molecule using the tip, and then by fiddling around, uh, again by chance, uh, getting the right orientation of that molecule and the end of the tip, you can probe different molecular orbitals. And that's what this image is showing, these images are showing here. So panels D, E, and F are showing the same area, six nanometers across, on the same surface. So again, it's coronine on um, um, graphite, again, under UHV conditions. And it's three different images taken, not simultaneously, but taken one after the other. In between each of these, the, um, the molecule on the, on the tip apex was moved around a little bit. Uh, so in order to present a different frontier orbital at the end of the tip, and then you can use that to probe different molecular orbitals. Um, and we only were able to really figure out what was going on after we did some DFT calculations to, uh, which I've shown in the uh, column on the right, which just shows the different arrangement of different molecular orbitals. Um, and so this is just a prime example of the fact that in order to interpret an STM image, you need to know what you're looking at. So you would never use STM to look at a sample that you know nothing about. Uh, because you're not going to learn very much. Um, so I've said a little bit about atomic and molecular, man, molecular manipulation. Um, I'll, so this, this image is from uh, 1990, uh, well, yeah, 1990. Uh, it's xenon atoms. So each blue dot that you see is a single xenon atom uh, that has been positioned um, on uh, a nickel surface. Uh, using a low temperature STM, it was done by Don Eigler in IBM, uh, in Almaden. And in fact, it was this image, which I uh, was halfway through my um, undergraduate degree at this, at this point, I saw this and thought, I want to work on this, um, and I haven't looked back since. Um, and then the image underneath is, so again, um, if you haven't seen an STM in action, I, I can forgive you for thinking that this is uh, just somebody playing with Photoshop, um, but it is actually an STM image of individual iron atoms on a copper surface. And there are so many things happening in this image, it would take one seminar on its own. But each blue uh, pyramidal structure, each feature that you see is a single iron atom. They've been uh, positioned in place using an STM tip. So, uh, Manipulating atoms is uh, it's reasonably straightforward uh, with STM. Um, there are many different ways in which you can do it. You can either use the tip to push things across the surface, to pull them, or you can pick things up with the tip and then drop them back down again. Uh, these things are all done. Uh, these, these images, that are certainly the bottom one was taken by uh, actually dragging atoms along uh, a surface. Um, and the ripples that you see, so if you look at this image, you see circular wave pattern and ripples. What that's showing is it's showing the electron standing waves uh, in the system, which are, which are evident because you're at very low temperature and the coherence length of the surface electrons is on the order of several nanometers. Um, then, this is my very favorite. Um, so this was uh, IBM clearly getting a bit bored. Uh, so if you can read this, you're too close. So again, each spot that you see is a single uh, single carbon monoxide molecule on a copper surface. Um, okay. 
Uh, then again, this is just reminding you of this this um, this video that is worth having a look at, uh, just to show you what you can do um, with an STM. So these are just different screenshots. So I want to move on to the atomic force microscope because it is it is far more powerful than uh, the scanning tunneling microscope, and it came about five years later uh, by the same people or some of the same people who invented the STM. So this is just an example of an AFM. Um, it's the one we have, one of the ones in, in my lab. Um, and the basic idea is um, that you have a, you also have a sharp probe tip that's got atomic dimensions. Uh, in fact, I'll just zoom in. Uh, so that's what an AFM tip looks like. Uh, a sharp one can have a radius of curvature of a few nanometers. These tips are mounted on a cantilever beam, which acts as a generalized force sensor. So when a probe when the tip comes close to a sample surface and starts to interact with it, uh, then uh, that's manifested as a bending of that cantilever beam, which we can measure with uh, very uh, high resolution. Um, and it's typically done using uh, what's called an optical lever. So you have a laser beam, which uh, just shines on uh, near the end of the AFM cantilever. Um, and as that cantilever scans over the surface, that laser beam becomes deflected, and you can measure its position using a uh, four quadrant photo detector. Um, and there are many, many different things that you can do. Um, and the most common mode of AFM is called dynamic mode or tapping mode, where you uh, oscillate the cantilever near its mechanical resonance or near one of its mechanical resonances, because then you you not only have you not only can measure the deflection of the cantilever, but you can measure its oscillation resonance characteristics, such as the amplitude and phase, which opens a whole suite of uh, material property measurements to you. Um, and uh, so to again, give you some examples. So this is some work also done by IBM. Um, and um, so this is actually an AFM image of a pentacene molecule. Um, and just to give you an example, so the bottom left uh, panel B is an STM image of the same system where you can just see a sort of loosely defined um, electron cloud. Uh, but then with the AFM mode, you can actually image uh, individual bonds. And that's, that's the beauty of this, that you can image bonds rather than uh, atoms. Um, and the way they do it, and again, this is completely serendipitous, uh, that they were uh, working on what's called non-contact AFM. Again, it's a form of resonant AFM done, again, under UHV conditions at uh, 77 Kelvin. Um, and what they do is they pick up a carbon monoxide molecule on the end of the tip, and uh, that allows them to, uh, to then be able to resolve these uh, subatomic or bond level uh, features. Now, this has been applied, as many of you will be aware, uh, quite recently, over the last year or two, to looking at asphaltines, uh, so single asphaltine molecules. So these are just two examples uh, that have come out of the IBM group. Uh, so they're doing work with Shell. And uh, so the image on the left is an asphaltine from coal, and the right is from petroleum. Uh, so what they do is they basically literally take uh, some asphaltine uh, material, uh, flash evaporate it in a vacuum system onto a fresh uh, copper surface, um, and uh, then um, fiddle around with their tip in order to get a carbon monoxide molecule. Um, and then they can take these kind of images. Um, now, I have a couple of slides on you know, the, how contact and non-contact mode are. I'm not going to bother going through that because I, I, think, uh, I think many people know how these things work, and I think that we're better off focusing on what you can actually do with an AFM. Of course, I'm happy to discuss any of those actual measurement modalities later on. Uh, so these are just some uh, fairly pedestrian examples to start off with. Uh, so starting at very large scales and working our way down. Uh, so the image on the top left is actually a, a coin. Uh, so it's a, five micron, a four micron area of a 5p coin. And really all I just wanted to show is that you can see how the, uh, a little bit about how the coin was cast. Uh, I don't mean tossed in a gambling uh, sense, I mean how it was formed. You can see individual grains and you can see that they're uh, pressed together and that it was, uh, you can get some idea about the heat treatment that the coin underwent uh, during its fabrication just by looking at the grain size and the morphology. Uh, below that we've got a red blood cell. So again, uh, they're eight microns in diameter. 
A lot of AFM work has been done on these, actually looking at uh, plasmids, membrane uh, proteins. Uh, you can look at DNA, um, and we've done, again, some work looking at amyloid fibrils. Uh, so these are associated with many degenerative diseases, and AFM is a, is a very powerful technique to apply to looking at amyloid fibrils. Um, so that's just basic imaging, but we're, we're interested in what you can do beyond that. Um, again, I have a slide that I'm not going to say much about. It's better to talk about the actual results. But uh, there is a technique known as phase imaging, which is uh, standard in all AFMs. When you operate in uh, resonance mode, so oscillating the cantilever near its resonance, then uh, if you track the phase of the cantilever uh, relative to the uh, driving signal, then uh, by monitoring changes in the phase, you can uh, extract a little bit of information about uh, the mechanical properties of the surface you're looking at. It's completely qualitative, um, but nonetheless, it gives you useful, um, useful information. So what can you measure? with an AFM, so with, with uh, phase information. So this is just an example. It's coronine molecules again on HOPG. So these were actually sputtered on, uh, whereas the previous examples that I showed you of coronine on HOPG, they're actually um, sublimed, um, whereas these are sputtered. And you see a number of different features in the image on the top. Uh, so you some, see some areas uh, where uh, higher resolution images indicate that the molecules are actually nicely ordered in a monolayer. You've got some areas that are totally disordered, and then you've just got plain HOPG. So the topography actually tells you quite a lot, but if you look at the phase image below, um, it's got an awful lot of contrast, and it's, you see that there's completely different uh, phase from ordered and disordered areas uh, of these molecules, and which is different again from HOPG. So again, it's in indicative of different uh, it's, well, it's telling you that there's a different force gradient that the tip is experiencing, which, which you can ascribe to different uh, mechanical properties. Um, and these are just a couple of images. Uh, that's uh, gold, um, gold and mica, just showing individual atomic terraces. Um, we do some work with uh, colleagues in Oxford looking at iron nanoparticles that are using catalysts. So again, th this is the fairly bog standard stuff that you can do. This is a graphene device, um, so we're interested in graphene devices, and I'll show you some data in a few minutes, uh, where if you just take a conventional uh, topographic image using an AFM uh, with these sort of devices, it's really difficult to see where the graphene is because you, know, you typically are putting electrodes that are tens of nanometers thick on a piece of graphene that's less than one nanometer thick, and it's quite hard to see anything. But if you look at the phase, which this is a phase image, then the graphene is immediately obvious. Um, and um, so I'm just, you know, forgive me as I scan through, because I'm more interested, most interested in mechanical properties, and that's what I want to spend the last sort of 10 minutes talking about. So we've been working on a technique for the last, uh, last number of months where um, that goes beyond the sort of qualitative um, sort of pretty pictures that you get from phase images and into the, the, quant the quantitative uh, realm of material property uh, measurement. So the basic principle is that you oscillate. So it's a form of contact mode. It's a cross between contact and tapping mode. So you, the tip is in contact with the surface, and you uh, periodically um, oscillate the tip so um, to basically push it into the surface and then pull it back out again, and so that you can um, explore the whole way from uh, ohmic contact. Sorry, ohmic contact. Uh, mechanical, direct mechanical contact to, uh, you can measure short range interactions and long range interactions. And you can use this to, to map uh, or to measure at a single point. You can map the elastic modulus of the surface, um, the amount by which the surface becomes deformed by the probe as the probe pushes into it. You can measure the adhesion force between the probe and the surface. You can measure the adhesion energy between the probe and the surface. Um, and it's all done uh, using uh, recent developments in AFM where we have closed loop scanners in all three directions, which means that when you push a tip uh, or move a tip, you know how much you're actually moving it by. Um, and if you know the mechanical properties of your cantilever, which you can now measure quite accurately, uh, you can, uh, by looking at the relative motion of the cantilever on the surface as you push a tip into a surface, you can actually extract information about how much the, how the surface is responding. And with appropriate contact mechanics models, you can then extract information about the, um, 
what the tip is doing. Now I've taken, we, we've done a lot of work on this uh, actually for BP and for other industrial partners, which uh, I'm not going to show you today because we're not allowed. So I'm going to show you some general stuff, um, and which, which I've taken from uh, the NTMDT uh, site. So that's a company that manufactures uh, AFMs because they've got some really nice representative information and they're happy for me to show you today. Um, so what we've got is we've got some carbon nanotubes on a silicon surface, you see there, and so this is just an example. You can simultaneously uh, map the conductivity. So if you've got an electrically conductive tip uh, and the elastic modulus of the surface. And it's, again, it's not just pretty pictures, but there are actual numbers to this that you can do quantitative mapping. Uh, another example, this is a particular favorite of mine, is so we've got fluorinated alkane, alkanes on graphite. So the scale, the entire image, each image is one micron across. This information, the uh, three images on the left, so height, adhesion, and stiffness were all taken simultaneously. Um, and so you see these um, uh, ordered layers of alkanes on the surface. And uh, you can see that uh, different layers with different molecular orientation of different adhesion and different stiffness. Um, and they also, if you look at the image on the top right, so that's an image that was taken just after, um, it's showing the surface potential. Uh, so by surface potential, what I mean is the contact potential difference between the uh, probe tip and the surface. So these are things that, that you can measure uh, with AFM and it opens up so many possibilities uh, apart from just basic topography imaging, which was uh, where we were all at just a few years ago. Uh, basically, in, in it's like being in a cot and now we're in the whole playground. Um, and so where that opens into then is so this just uh, just have a few slides on functional materials because this is now bringing everything together from surface um, uh, sort of surface probing manipulation patterning surface engineering all all it all comes together with this these uh, next couple of examples I want to show you. Um, so ferroelectrics are uh, ubiquitous as as many of you know. They're using flash memory devices, ORF filters, uh, piezo lighters, probably not the best application, uh, actuators. So mobile phones are, in fact, all cameras that have an autofocus will have a piezoelectric actuator in it. So um, ferroelectrics um, are materials that have a spontaneous electric polarization and the, the electrical equivalent or analog of ferromagnetic materials. Um, and our particular interest is in engineering the shape and size of ferroelectric elements and thin films in order to control their properties. Um, so a specific goal is to, um, is to, and I did some work with Samsung on this, is to create uh, higher density uh, data storage devices using ferroelectric materials. Um, and again, I'll fl flick through some slides because I want to uh, not uh, keep it going too long. So what are the sort of things that we can measure with an AFM that are relevant to functional materials? Um, so we do, like I said, you can, you can image uh, ferroelectric domain structures. So ferroelectric systems are equivalent to ferromagnetic systems in that they will spontaneously form domain structures in an attempt to uh, minimize their electrostatic free energy. Um, and uh, you can use um, an AFM to actually not just image those domain structures, but you can manipulate them. Uh, because the tip is basically, if you've got a conductive tip, you can use it to locally apply an electric field, which, you can use, which in turn uh, modifies the electric polarization. Um, and you can use that to control the domain structure. And this ultimately has an effect on how these materials behave when they're in something like a ferroelectric capacitor in a RAM device. Um, and we're also interested in ferromagnetic materials. I'll show you some more examples of each uh, properly in a minute. Um, and so we have a topography image of some permalloy nanostructures and then a magnetic image taken simultaneously. And by looking at the contrast in the magnetic image, we can uh, extract quite a lot of information about the magnetization distribution and magnitude within those structures and how it depends on the local geometry and size of the structures that we've made. Um, so how do we actually map domains in a ferroelectric material? What's the, what's the principle? So the idea is that ferroelectric materials are also piezoelectric. So what we have here is just, so this is, so we do a lot of simulation work on this. So we have a tip 
uh, coming down from the top, and so it's got a radius of R. It's in contact with a piezoelectric material. Uh, so the bottom panel is showing the electric field uh, that's emanating from the tip in our piezoelectric material. Uh, it creates or it induces an electric polarization, which is as shown here. So again, this is just a first principle calculation that we do. Um, and so the main point really just showing you that the the size of area that's being probed is comparable to the uh, radius of curvature of the tip. Um, and so you can get really quite high resolution with this. So the idea is that um, because these materials are piezoelectric, the electric field that you apply actually induces a strain in the surface, which causes the surface to deform. And it may only be a few picometers, but we can measure that quite easily with a good AFM. Uh, and then we can use this to map uh, domain um, the domain distribution. It's a very complicated system, as you can imagine, because there are many different uh, uh, different uh, interactions occurring all at the same time. Uh, but we've got a good handle on this because uh, you've got surface charges to think about, uh, long range electrostatic forces, you've got piezoelectric forces, electrostriction, um, all sorts of things occurring at the same time, which uh, contribute to what you see in a typical image. The most important thing is, what can we actually do with this? So we can uh, engineer domains. So this is the typical propaganda um, that we do. And in fact, the very first image that I showed on the opening slide is one like this, where we've engineered, uh, using domain engineering, we've engineered the BP symbol. Um, this is the University of Cambridge uh, crest. So this is a 12 micron area. So it's a polycrystalline uh, P PZT film. So it's the most commonly used piezoelectric ferroelectric material. Um, and um, simultaneously, um, we've got a, what's called a phase image, which is showing the electric polarization of the surface. Um, and uh, this is a map taken uh, just a few minutes later in, in uh, what's called Kelvin probe mode. So it's, again, a form of uh, atomic force microscopy where you map surface potential. So again, the aim really, my aim for today is not to uh, just confuse you, um, but it's just to give you an idea of the sort of things that we can that we can measure. Just a few more things to go through. Um, so again, it's surface engineering and structure mapping and so on. So this is I just want to tell you about some work we did with uh, Samsung, um, and um, so the idea is to uh, was to create a new type of uh, spin valve device um, using um, and also have some uh, magnetic logic and so the idea was to create nanostructures that are magnetic, control their magnetic properties through their uh, size and geometry. We simulate uh, using first principles in micromagnetics what the um, magnetic characteristics should be like and then we test all of it using an atomic force microscope. Um, and so the idea is, so on the, the left, you've got uh, an electron micrograph of some devices that we made. Then uh, the next panel, the simulate bit, is just showing. Uh, so we did uh, calculations. That's actually a, the top image is an, a magnetic force microscope tip. So it's an atomic force microscope tip that's got a magnetic thin film on it. Uh, so it becomes sensitive to uh, magnetic forces between the tip and the surface. And so we, we modeled the interaction between the probe and the surface to, in order to be able to determine what, you know, what we're measuring. And then the bottom is showing a uh, simulated magnetic force microscope image, which you see, and you see the real thing on the bottom left. Um, and again, more interested in showing you the next. This is, uh, this is actually something that was just done uh, by a member of the group last week. Uh, so we're, we're interested in, so what we have here is, it's a graphene device. So you see the scale bar, this is an AFM topography image. We've got um, iron electrodes on, so the, the yellow structures that you see are iron electrodes, they're 30 nanometers thick, and they're on CVD graphene. And what we do is we put this into the AFM, which has a magnetic field generator in it, and we can take um, uh, MFM images, so showing the magnetic domain structure and what it's doing. So what I've got is I've created a small movie uh, showing these magnetic force microscope images as a function of the applied field. Now, it's the image that you see is it's upside down compared to the actual device. So you, if you notice from the actual device, the thinnest line that we have is on the bottom. 
in the magnetic force microscope image, the thinnest line is on the top. So bright areas are areas where the magnetic field, net magnetic field from these lines, because they are magnetic, they're made out of iron, is pointing upwards, and the dark areas are where it's pointing downwards. So what we've done is we've cycled the magnetic field. The field is being applied along the x direction, and it's applied, in, first of all, in the positive x direction, then negative, then positive, then negative. And so what you'll notice is that the ends of these lines basically they all switch at different times, uh, which is what you would expect given the fact that they have different sizes. Uh, so this is what you can do with a magnetic force microscope. So you can probe these different um, these different uh, processes happening in not exactly real time, but near enough. Uh, so again, you can see uh, these lines uh, switching the magnetization direction, and of course the real idea is to combine this with electrical measurements so you can actually demonstrate that you've got a spin valve. Then the last topic for one minute is um, about exploring oil-rich chalk surfaces. So this is a project that we had with BP. Uh, it's not an ICAM project um, and again this is in the public domain, it's all published. Um, and the idea was to, uh, to look at wettability of uh, chalk surfaces using an AFM. So I only, it, I literally have one slide with a few pictures to give you the basic idea. So if you look at a, a, a chalk sample, so you see these uh, coccolith structures, so these round um, platelet structures, so these are just the coccoliths that uh, make up the chalk. Uh, it's in between these pores you have uh, oil. And the idea is that um, some, it is known that these surfaces should be uh, oleophobic. Um, but the, in some areas, they turn out to be oleophobic and others oleophilic. Um, and so with AFM, with, with chemical force microscopy, so again, it's all these names, um, with chemical force microscopy is a branch of AFM where you uh, functionalize the AFM tip uh, with a molecular layer, which basically you can have it that it's either acidic or basic or hydrophilic or hydrophobic. And by monitoring the force between the probe and the surface, you can actually determine if you have regions on the surface that are hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Um, and that's, that's the basic idea. Um, and so this is, again, an AFM image of a number of those coccoliths on the surface. This is pushing AFM very much out of its comfort zone because these are very rough surfaces, um, which lead to very frustrated postdocs. Um, and what we have here is, so just to zoom in on a uh, slightly larger than uh, 500 nanometer area, uh, it's on, actually on top of one of these uh, coccolith um, platelets. And what you have is, so the topography on the left, the variations in height are on the order of a few nanometers, so there's not a lot going on. Um, and if you look at the adhesion energy, and the, and the pull-off force, which is the adhesion force, and measure the force between the tip and the surface. What you see is you see areas that are where you've got a high pull-off force, so they're the bright areas, um, and so there, there, and there mainly, and you've got areas where you have a low pull-off force. Um, and the point is that this is just, you know, coccoliths are effectively calcite, um, but they are, but the uh, surface chemistry uh, does vary quite significantly from one area to another. And it seems to have a characteristic length scale of these, these patches of different hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, which is on the order of uh, 100 nanometers. So you do have patches on the surface that have different uh, wettability. Um, and then the very last thing, rather than go through this, so this is my last slide, um, I just want to say a little bit about the, you know, patterning of materials and actually how you go about um, creating nanostructures. So we do, we have two different techniques. I mean, there are a whole multitude of techniques that you can use to pattern surfaces, uh, all the way from just molecular deposition, self-assembly, uh, to this fairly large scale stuff. But this is um, just an example. So we do ion milling. Uh, so we do focus ion beam milling and broad beam ion milling to create uh, nanostructures in functional materials. Uh, so the top left, is, so these are all images of the same material. Top left is just showing uh, structures that were made in PTT by ion milling. Uh, then the images underneath are uh, AFM. Uh, so the bottom left is an AFM topography image. And uh, panel C then is an AFM phase image. And the contrast is just indicative of the fact that we've got different materials. 
So we actually down here we have um, a silicon surface and then we have PZT and they're different mechanical properties so they show up very nicely in a phase image. Um, and um, then other forms of uh, patterning that we do is, uh, so instead of just removing material, we also add material. Uh, so that's conventional electron beam lithography or optical lithography. Uh, so what we have here is, so this is actually the work that we did with Samsung. So we have an, um, an optical image of an electrode pattern. So the yellow structures that you see are gold. Uh, so what we have here is a gold microwire. And those dots that you see on top of it are uh, permaloy, um, they're um, magnetic quantum dots. The idea is you pass a current through this wire, produces a magnetic field, and that magnetic field can then uh, switch the magnetization of these magnetic dots. Um, and this is um, an AFM image of that central area of that dot, of that wire rather. So you have an area just here where uh, there are some dots missing, and that's an AFM image of the same area. Um, and uh, I can't show you the rest because it's, um, well, it's uh, Samsung, but it's, um, but you can simultaneously take magnetic force microscopy image, look at the domain structure, and you can actually observe individual bits as they, as they switch. And then, of course, the idea is that each bit that you see there is actually a data bit in a, uh, in a uh, high density memory device. So, to conclude, um, so there are many, many different things that we can do with scanning probe microscopy that range all the way from uh, very fundamental looking at uh, atoms on surfaces and moving things around and playing basically to uh, starting to be able to engineer surfaces. But it's really um, the atomic force microscope that is incredibly powerful because up until a few years ago it was very uh, qualitative, um, you know, you have to go to a lot of trouble to understand what images were telling you, but now you can do quantitative uh, property measurement. Uh, it, it opens up very many new windows. I have but touched the tip of this particular iceberg because there is, there is an awful lot more. Um, I didn't get to touch on uh, what you can do by combining AFM with optics um, and many of the other things you can do with uh, nanoscale engineering because um, I felt this was something that would be where there was a bit of a gap in the knowledge base. So, okay, thank you. Okay.